Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Killing Me Smalls podcast. I am your host, Mike Small. I've got a very special guest, this handsome fella sitting right next to me on the on the video. But before we get into it, I want to just give you a couple of heads up. We will be talking a lot of Sixers next week. I know that the trade window opened yesterday. They really haven't done a damn thing as it, at, at the time of this recording. They did not get Drew Holiday. They did not get Bogdan Bogdanovich. They did not get CP3. Buddy Heald is saying he wants to go to Dallas. I don't know what's going to happen. My gut tells me that um, I've got a guy from North Carolina here. My gut tells me that that guy from Duke, Elton Brand, squandered all of their assets last year. And they're going to probably go with the narrative of, hey, we now have a better coach that's going to coach all these guys. Um, and probably do some things on the margins. We'll see. We'll see. There's still plenty of time. It's only been open for 24 hours. But hey, this guy next to me here, Andy Dinkin, was a really, really good college football player at the University of North Carolina. He wasn't a star. He was around some stars. He played with guys you may have heard of that were in the NFL for for a long time. Guys like Natron Means, Randy Jordan, Kevin Donnelly, um, you know, and, and plenty of others, Corey Holiday, Tommy Thigpen, Dwight Hollier, all those guys were NFL players, and he wasn't. He was a guard on a team that went 1-10, and ten, and then by the time he graduated, four years later, they were winning the Peach Bowl, and under Coach Mack Brown, who's back there now, who won a national championship at Texas, and they're winning again, and Andy's had quite a journey. So Andy, like I said, was was a good college football player. He never went pro. But he wrote a book. It's called Going Pro in Life. It's a really, really good book. Andy and I became friends back in, let's see when this was. It was 1989. Wow, that was a long time ago. That's right. Um, 1989, I was the person that was the producer for Mac Brown and Dean Smith's television show. I had just graduated from college. I'd moved on campus at the University of North Carolina. I did the player features. I wrote for a newspaper called Carolina Blue. I used to sit in the training table and wait for football players to finish eating and basketball players, hoping they'd talk to me for a few minutes so I could write an article. Then I'd do the player features. And um, it took me a while to build those relationships. And Andy was one of the first people that I got to know. And he helped me meet a lot of other players and said, this guy's okay. And I was able to build some relationships and had an incredible experience there over four years. But Andy has moved on and has been successful in life, in the business world, and is now giving back. And Andy, welcome to the Killing Me Smalls podcast. Talk to me about your journey. Yeah, it's great to be here, Mike. We've obviously known each other and had a friendship for a long time. So to be here doing this is really cool. You know, you said I was a really good football player. I might say good. I don't know about really good. Well, you are a guest. I have to beef you up a little bit. You 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 were solid. Well, I worked hard. I was fortunate enough to, to, after sitting on the bench for two seasons, starting the better part of three seasons on an ACC team. So I'm proud of what I accomplished. And I made the decision after graduation to not move back to the D.C. area where I was from, but to purposely make a conscientious choice to stay in North Carolina to try and leverage whatever the cachet would have been from being a former Tar Heel football player. And it's just worked out really well. I I, I was able to use my athletic status and what that uh, access to people and and the stories I could tell to potential employers about the hard work and discipline. So I really felt like I've taken every ounce of what's been given to me as a football player and have used it to really have a good life, a good career, great friendships. And I always said then, and I continue to say, I didn't want to let football use me. I wanted to use football as something that could could catapult me to greater things in life. Well, let's think about this a little bit. I mean, you know, you were a Division One athlete, and and I know that I'm in the business world, and I look, I love to hire athletes. Why? They're competitive. Um, they know the value of hard work. They like to, you know, they're used to team environments, so they know how to work as a team and and build each other up. Those things are really, really important. What I noticed when I read your book is that a lot of the things that you have as skills are things that, that were natural back then. I mean, talk about your first experience of knowing that what you were able to leverage as a football player works in a in a in the business world 
Sure. Well, as someone who's read the book, you recall there's a story in there where I talk about how I was at a scholarship banquet before my senior year. And at this banquet, I met a man named Rick Kramer from my hometown of Potomac, Maryland. And we just had a nice conversation, nothing special, but he gave me his business card. I took it upon myself to write him a handwritten note, just thanking him for being a Tar Heel supporter and great to have a uh, a supporter and friend in my hometown and mailed it off and didn't think much of it. Within a few days of him getting it, he calls my mother who calls me and says, I don't know what it is you said or did with this man, Mr. Kramer, but he thinks you hung the moon and he's anxious to meet with you again. And he's talking about internships. And, uh, and so we met and I got a great summer internship selling telecom services before my senior year of college. As part of that internship, I got some incredible sales training from a company in Greenville, South Carolina, where I really met some really influential, neat business people. And as a result of that experience, I knew that I wanted to be in sales and that I wanted to uh, do certain things professionally because I was able to figure out what I loved to do and was really good at as a result of that internship. And more importantly, already had references in the workforce that were willing to tell other potential employers about me. And for somebody that had a pretty average GPA, I created a bidding war for my services, had lots of great job offers coming out of college. And it didn't seem so unique, but as I looked around, I quickly realized that it was. And so I got a great first job in Charlotte and continued to use my status as a former player to gain access and, and, and build my career accordingly. You had some advantages though that a lot of people don't. Uh, you're very outgoing. You're, you're naturally gifted in terms of being able to connect with people. I would say that there's a lot of people that don't have that gift. There's a lot of people that have shocked me as I've gotten into the business world. You know, I work with a lot of science people who really have a hard time making those connections. I wonder how much of the talent that you were able to reference in your book are things that you had, you know, that you were born with and things that you had to develop. Was well, that something that was obvious to you as you wrote the book? Well, I'll answer it this way, Mike. I had some good nurturing. You know, my mom made it a point to, to impress upon my brother that if we were able to, ever to walk into a stranger's house or anybody's house for that matter, for a meal that we better not show up empty handed, you know, no. stop, uh, stop off and get flowers or, or a plant or something. So I had good nurturing and a good uh, upbringing. It sounds like I did, but shout but out I to also, Mrs. Dinkin. That's right. But I also have infused myself with everything in the world of personal development from Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and Earl Nightingale and Norman Vincent Peale. You know, when I graduated school, I decided to enroll in what I call automobile university. So I've been listening to great content in my car since I since mm -hmm. I was a 22 year old kid. So some is nurture, some is nature. But what I would say, Mike, is the things I talk about in my book are even more important for somebody that maybe isn't naturally outgoing. For example, anybody can go online and research somebody by searching their name in Google before they meet them. And you can take the information you learn to craft questions that will gain further interest from that person. So it really doesn't matter if this comes naturally to you or not. You have to learn these skills if you want to get ahead in your career. And these skills can be learned. And so at the core of my teachings are step by step instructions that really anybody can do. You know, it's interesting as I as I read your book. A couple of things stood out to me, and I'm popping it open right now. A couple of the chapters that you have uh, are managing your time, setting your college goals. I mean, I don't know a lot of college kids that set goals other than to graduate and and uh, you know maybe have a really really good time. So so you were ahead of the game there. You talked about networking. You talked about building your brand, managing your attitude. And meant getting a mentor, which I thought was was is very insightful. How much of that, again, you know, I mean, a lot of these things are easier to do now with the world of social media. It's a lot easier to connect with people and make them a Facebook friend. But the 
that's not a relationship. You talk about depth of relationship. Can you talk about the difference and how you realized that there was a difference? Well, you can look at our relationship, Mike. You know, I, it was sincere that I wanted to get to know you, but as a result of building a friendship, I got a ton of publicity in Carolina Blue. More than articles written trip. about you, and you got on TV a lot just because you're nice. Right. To me. So, <laughs> I guess like a lot of things in life, Mike, when you see that what you're doing creates positive benefit, you tend to keep doing those things again and again, and so. Again, some of it may be may have been innate, but I saw success in doing those things. So I kept doing them and kept trying to do them better. I also had a great mentor and coach Brown. You know, I write a chapter on attitude. Well, you were around those seasons. We went one in 10, two seasons in a row, but you were there. It wasn't a negative environment. We were full of hope. We were full of exuberance. I went into every game thinking we were gonna win. And I think most of my teammates did as well. So Coach Brown really played a big part in my life on the power of positive attitude. Coach Brown is an incredible handwritten note writer himself. So when you see people that you really love, trust, and respect doing those things, I, I for one, just wanted to emulate those things. You know, it's amazing how much a handwritten note matters. I've got a, a handwritten note from Dean Smith right there that's sitting right next to my desk that I look at all the time. And you know, that's, that's very important to me and it's valuable. And you talked about how coach Brown was like that. Interesting. You talk about those two, one in 10 years. I was, I started after the second, during the second one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you know what I was doing, I, I produced his television show. So after they would lose 40, whatever to nothing against Duke, he would address the team, address the media, then have to shower, change, put on a suit and come to his TV show. Mm -hmm. I would think to myself, oh my God, this is going to suck. This guy cannot. And he would just come in and be like, hey man, how you doing? We're getting better. We're going to figure it out. And uh, that always amazed me. And I, you know, I'm sure it wasn't all natural. I'm sure a lot of it was forced. I'm sure he went home and was pretty miserable. And I learned something from that. Talk about your relationship with him. You know, as a football coach, he's got a relationship with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, not to mention players, alumni, coaches, other coaches, people he's recruiting, um, recruiting coordinators, high school coaches. How does a guy like that stay in touch with so many people? And how did your relationship evolve with him? Well, I think that's one of the things that makes him so unique. Not everybody's a coach, Mac Brown. Not everybody's in the Hall of Fame. And he's in the business of coaching football players and, and coaching his staff, but he's really in the people business. And I think his success is a result of his people skills and getting people in the right position to be successful. My relationship with him was great when I was in college, but when I really saw the benefit of that relationship is when I moved to Charlotte and took my first job. And within months after moving here, he came to town for the annual booster club meeting, the Rams club event. And the Charlotte meeting is the biggest one in the state, 700, 800, a thousand people. And so coach Brown has given his talk. And at some point he says, yeah, I want to make sure that everybody here knows that, that uh, one of our own Andy Dinkin has moved to Charlotte. And here I am. He has me stand up. You know, we love Andy. He competed for us. Make sure you put your arms around him, hug his neck. Week you know, in, week out. It's the Andy Dickens of the world that are going to get this thing turned around. All that, all that is only Coach Brown can. And so he, he he gets done speaking and everybody wants to come over and meet me. And then I get to walk up and hug it out with Coach. And so I would say in, in, in that circle of people, in that influential, prominent circle of Charlotte businessmen and women, I was a rock star. I didn't have to go out and do anything. I just had to stand there and be myself. And because of Coach Brown, I had all the credibility in the world. And it was pretty awesome. And so you can better believe I showed up at the Rams Club meeting the next year and the year after that and 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 wrote Coach Brown a note thanking him. And, and when I got married and my wife started sending out holiday cards, we always sent one to Coach Brown, still do. Um, I went to visit him in Texas. So I proactively built it. Uh, a relationship, proactively maintain that relationship and, and what a beautiful thing it is. 
But I'm not alone. That like I will, too, I will play you with Coach Brown. He he's that way with everybody. Yeah. I mean, all the guys that played for him, they can get to him anytime. He'd do anything for his former players. You know, it's it's so hard to keep up relationships. I mean, I think LinkedIn is is the greatest thing ever for that because you kind of keep your relationships all in one spot. But you've been doing this since before social media, which I think is even more impressive. And when I read your book, I think about the people that are not college athletes. I think about the people that could really benefit from a handwritten note, from developing a mentor, from you know building not just a, hey, how are you, but a, a deep relationship, a meaningful relationship. Who could really benefit from this book? Well, obviously, I think college student athletes and their parents and administrators can. I would say any college student could, but I would say anybody that's interested in building more depth in their relationships in, in, in the workforce, in the business world, salespeople, college kids. I wrote it as a niche book. That was a business decision. And I may write other books on the subject, but you don't have to be a student athlete to benefit from this content. You could be anybody that just wants to build more depth in your, your personal and professional relationships. It's a great read. It's an easy read. It's not, you know, it's not super thick. You can knock that thing out in about a day. Um, and I know that you've got some some uh, sessions that you've built and a workbook you've built um, to use with it. How are you marketing this thing? Are you are are you going out and speaking to corporations? Are you going to? I know you had an opportunity to speak to your former team. Tell me about what you're doing and what can. And if there's people that are listening that are like, wow, I think I know people that could benefit from it. How can they do that? Well, the number one thing you can do is, is, is buy the book. That, that would be the first place I would recommend a parent of a student athlete or a student athlete to start. Get the book. It'll give you a lot of great information that you can literally start implementing immediately. It, it's a great stocking stuffer. If people are looking for gifts uh, for their college student athlete children for the holidays, put it on your list. But I've also created a companion career development seminar that's about a four hour course. It's available. You can watch it anytime, any place where I really go into greater depth on the, the portion of the book that focuses on finding a great first job. Because as I tell the kids I mentor and as I say in my book, Mike, any yeah. fool can find a job. But what you really need to seek is, is finding something that it is that you love to do and you're really good at. And that comes through discovery. And as a college student athlete, you have access to people in the workforce that other college student athletes don't. Use those relationships now, get internships, do shadow days in the field, learn how to inquire about what people do professionally so you can start developing your own idea of what it is you think you'd be really good at. Because as you know, Mike, if you, if, if you don't plan Oftentimes you don't get to where you want to go and you've seen it. So many guys and gals that, that put everything into their college sports career really don't know what they want to do afterwards and, and they don't get out off to a great start. John Wooden, failure to plan is planning to fail. That's um, right. You've got some really interesting stories and anecdotes in there and I, I really recommend this thing. And, and normally this podcast is dedicated to talking about the Sixers or the Phillies or the Flyers or the Eagles or the Dolphins or Alabama football or North Carolina basketball or college, whatever it is. I just, I loved your book. And, you know, I, I think you're a great guy and I really wanted people to hear from you. One of the things that, that I also find interesting about, about this and the fact that you did it is I feel like so much of the talent that you have that you were able to articulate in this book are things that, you know, it, it's almost like a savant where, where it just came so naturally to you to do these things. I feel like a lot of these, th you know, a lot of people talk about the fact that, you know, some of the greatest athletes are some of the worst coaches because they just expect everybody to work and do things like them. And, and when they don't, they can't figure out why. And I feel like there's a part of this that, that where you are doing some of these things so naturally, because I knew you when you were 18, 19 years old, and that's what you did. And that's who you were. How much of that has been an adjustment for you to try to sit down with people? Like, I'll give you an example. I'm in the business world and I feel like a lot of the things that I do in terms of communication come natural to me. Um, but I work with a lot of scientific people that it does not. And it, I find that difficult sometimes. 
has it been hard for you in that vein to be able to find to to work with people that just don't find these things natural to do well what it's forced me to do mike is to be very step by step and process oriented because things that might come naturally to, to you and me because we're people people doesn't to others so i've had to be very process oriented and i've had to look at little tricks of the trade so for example in the book i tell kids if you're shy and aren't naturally good at networking and meeting new people that when you go to an event ask the organizer if you can work the check-in booth because what happens when you work the check-in booth you get a chance to meet everybody and you're sort of the the the, the front of the whole deal and so after you get done with the booth and you're hanging out well everybody already feels a little familiar with you yeah so yeah it did force me to, to look outside what comes natural to me and to try and quantify it in ways that i could teach others how to put these skills in, into action. The other thing that really stood out to me was the little things. I mean, when you were an athlete, it was the little things, right? It was understanding you were a guard. It was understanding, you know, um, all of the different uh, offensive plays that didn't have anything to do with you so that you knew you were in the right position when nature on means wanted to go up the gut That's or right. what have you. Um, but it's the little things here, right? It's it's that thank you note. It's that, that handshake. It's that follow-up. I think that's just so important. Yeah, what well, about, I think it yeah. is. Too. And, and again, you keep talking about my natural skills, which I appreciate. But I will tell you, Mike, this stuff can be learned. And and somebody that gets their 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 uh, their nose into this book can can put it down and immediately go and improve their LinkedIn page or start a LinkedIn page if they mm -hmm. don't have one or go to Vistaprint and buy personalized stationery and send a note to their high school coach and other people that are meaningful to them. So this stuff can be learned. I'm passionate about helping college student athletes reach their potential. I've come across so many kids who were on their way to dead end jobs, on their way to literally working in construction yards at $8 an hour. And when I say, wait a minute, N not on my watch and we go into these processes they know people and they they always say to me andy yeah all these people were so happy to help me and i say of course they were they've loved you they've been following your whole career they're your biggest fans and then these kids networked a great job and they have the success that they deserve that's fantastic you know i have a junior in college and a sophomore in college and they are going to be talking to you about their job applications before we get them out well, that's great. And look, Mike, as you know, because you were on campus, there's never a time in a, in a college kid's life where they're going to have so many wonderful people and support structure around them. And the minute right. they play their last game and the minute they walk off campus, the brightness of their star diminishes, their access to people and opportunity diminishes. And so I really want them to harness this opportunity now while they, while they have it. And, and I'm hopeful that that literally uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of kids and their families will benefit from this content I've created. The name of the book, Going Pro in Life by Andy Dinkin. You can find it on Amazon. You can Google it. You can contact me as a result of listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube. And hopefully you'll get a chance to uh, continue to watch the Killing Me Smalls podcast on YouTube. You can find it on the Painted Lines Network. It's on a whole YouTube network. We do movie reviews, stuff about the Sixers, Flyers, Eagles, Phillies, um, all kinds of great content, and it's a lot, a lot of fun. Andy Dinkin, thank you so much for joining the Killing Me Smalls podcast. I wish you the best. We'll get you back to talk a little bit of sports another time, but again, going pro in life, get it, and I think you won't be disappointed.